Well, three hours. <laughs> I, I think it was fun. Yeah. So we, we, we spent about a whole uh, two minutes practicing that before. <laughs> I tell you, it sounded way better. <laughs> it the, the, practice, the two minute practice was better. Than <laughs> it was way better. It was way better. Oh, but well, we'll have to try it at, at the end. Here. But at the we'll have to uh, well, lean on the everlasting arms a little bit more. That's right, because what a fellowship, what a joy divine. Yeah. Oh, that's a great song. It is a great song, but not the way you played it. No, it reminds me of that that, <laughs> have you ever that movie. What is that movie? Um, mm, it's about this. Oh, you would love it. It's about this preacher who's actually not really a preacher. <laughs> He's trying to make a buck. Okay. Um, oh, it's a great movie. Uh, Doctor White, Richard White, let me uh, listen to it. Is it the? Uh, is it called The Saint or something like that? Oh, it sounds familiar. I don't think it's. Maybe, I maybe. Seen it. I haven't seen it. Yeah, it might be, but um, I know. Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. I've never seen it. He, he, um, he sings. It's kind of. Um, I mean, it has the. It has like the the fairy tale, kind of quasi dark sort of imagery, cinematography, and everything. And I mean, it's a it's a it's a fantastic film. Um, huh. But he sings that song, and it's just just oh, the really? con. Yeah, he's just sitting there, but he sings it like. Lean in, lean. <laughs> and, and it's it's just the contrast is, is just because he's a despicable guy. Oh, he's just a despicable, okay. despicable guy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but it, it it it's it's um it's probably the thing to listen to if you're um or the thing to watch if you're like going into youth ministry or something. <laughs> <laughs> No, I just I just mean because it, it it poses a lot of interesting questions. Yeah, no, I I know what you're saying. And sort of like Im- image, but interesting. Anyway, anyway, um, okay, so we will continue with Schindler Chapter Two. Uh, this was this was a a dense, great. Yeah. I mean, dense as as like a like a triple chocolate cake. No, I mean dense. it takes not like not like. Like, I, I don't want this. It's yeah. Just so like, yeah. No, it just takes me hours to read. I mean, because every page I feel like I have to highlight 20 things and explain things in the margins. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I was I was kind of – I was I was cutting it close this morning, making sure that yeah. I actually got it finished. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, I don't – I don't I, – I, I actually read about half of it before – yeah, I, I actually am laughing because uh, there's this is this book this version that I have you gave it to me. Oh yeah, because uh, <laughs> yours was falling apart and they gave you another one and so you, I, I bound this one. But there's there's only one comment in here on page forty six. Forty six, and what does it say? That you wrote, yes! Exclamation point. And, and what did it start with? Uh, it's Let's see if I did it's the right same after, thing. It's after right right after footnote forty four. Look what I did! <laughs> <laughs> My new edition. <laughs> No, but your new edition says yes. That's really funny, by the way. And, and it has three underlines. This one doesn't have any underlines. That just shows you I learned more. <laughs> so I, I made more emphasis. <laughs> more. Yeah, no, yeah. but it, it, it was a very good point. I'm just amazed that that was the only place that I saw anything written. Well, the reason – what I was trying to do is I was trying not to write in the book because it started falling apart. And, oh, okay. the, and then I got, I got the email saying, oh, sorry, Dr. Jagger. We'll give you a better book. And so, so I thought I'll give this book to you, and I don't want to write all over it. Yeah. And I started going. And I thought I just have to. <laughs> I got to write the something. <laughs> it is. It is a great point, though. Yeah. It is a great point. Yeah. But but I don't know if you want to start with that. No, I don't. I mean, that's that's almost at the very end of the. Yeah, it is. It is. But but this chapter um, was just uh, as I said last podcast. This book is saying everything that I wish I could have said before. That makes me understand myself and my yeah. own. My own concerns, my own, uh, my own loves. Yeah, it's all here. It's all here. Yeah. So I don't. I don't know where the. So there, there is. What are there? Three sections of this chapter. I think there's three sections. Our impoverished experience is okay. the first one. The second one is the doors of perception, and the third one is beauty as a place of encounter. Mm-hmm. And the. the bulk of the chapter i mean it's not that long of a chapter but most of it is chapter three section three yeah section three um uh and so so we can we can kind of maybe i don't know maybe walk through go one two three one two three 
Um, but because I'm a very ironic individual, um, I think the best way to begin section one is to actually start at the end of section three. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Only because, only because, only because on the bottom of 47, or I don't know, two-thirds of the way down. Yes. Um, you get this. Okay, this is at the very end. So, so Schindler is, is wrapping wrapping things up. Yeah. And he says this. Uh, and this is interesting just stylistically, right, like in regards to writing, that it's good at the end to, to, to more or less return to what you did at the beginning. Yeah. Right? And if it doesn't, if it doesn't, if you can't do that, then... We tend to think there's something problematic in it. T.S. Eliot would agree. Which I was just going to say might highlight a great metaphysical truth. <laughs> uh, uh, it is in this sense that beauty sets the horizon for a genuine human existence. Uh, horizon, okay, keep, keep going. On the other hand, um, we, we can get into this maybe a little bit later. On the other hand, uh, this completion is not a termination which would put an end to all activity. Instead, a horizon opens up a world. It erects a stage on which the drama of encounter can be played out. And then this is why I think it's important to, to start here. Our thesis has been, so this is the thesis. Our thesis has been that beauty enables a real encounter between man and the world. Mm -hmm. Right. So what, what you get going on in this chapter, chapter two, is... Uh, a discussion of beauty and the role that beauty plays in our ability to engage with reality and the degree to which we don't experience things through beauty or as beautiful um, or in light of beauty is the degree to which we don't experience them as real. Yeah, or, or or he almost says, "Don't experience them." Don't don't really experience them, right? Yeah, because yeah. um, in some ways, the only way to experience something is as real. As, Other, as otherwise, it really is. otherwise, yeah. otherwise, you're not experiencing it. You're experiencing uh, some sort of, you know, dream. Yeah, some imagined reality. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that so that your experiences actually don't correspond to any. It's almost it's it's like that you know that pathetic high schooler who thinks that the the girl because she like you know shook her her elbow that 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 was like a sign of like oh she must really like me right <laughs> he's like living in his like dream world and, he, and he's like interpreting everything just completely completely um contrary to what you're gonna you're, you're gonna cause somebody at the other end of this podcast to start crying because no. they're living in that world right yeah. now with that girl that sits in their philosophy class <laughs> no. or at least used to yeah <laughs> no, no i'm sorry i'm sorry sorry, maybe, sorry about that uh exploding the elbow shake for you guys no may, but maybe 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 it actually was maybe <laughs> she, maybe she said like you know shake your elbow twice if you want to go out on a date or i don't know <laughs> so, so maybe maybe i don't want to i don't want to like burst too many too many balloons or too many bubbles or ran on too many parades, whatever the... Well, let's just put it this way. Any chance they had of actually asking that girl out has been ruined by coronavirus yeah, anyway, yeah, so uh, yeah. might as well move on, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. That's right. Read Schindler in the meantime. <laughs> exactly. So, so next time you see an elbow shake, you know what it really means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Oh, all you good. poor schmucks on the other side yeah. of vocations. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> on the other side of vows. It's hilarious. <laughs> it stinks being you. Yeah. So, so here, here, uh, I, I think it's, it's just a beautiful way of putting it. And it, this chap, this chapter uh, has really helped me out a lot. Um, yeah, me too. Me and, too. And, and I, I've, I've all, I, I liked the uh, section one, which, which really was a. Um, a, a two-page history of philosophy. Yeah. Uh, so, so in some ways, a, an entire book can be written about this. This, this sort of falling away from beauty. Um, I, I think. I think this is this is a really important thing to to learn. Um, if you're if you're, you know, interested in philosophy and the development of ideas and things but i think the role that beauty plays or actually doesn't play now um is is one of the 
the sources of a lot of the, the conundrums in mm -hmm. in modernity, but then even going on into um, post-modernity to the contemporary um, situation we're, we're in. Uh, so I, I really liked how, how he did this. And um, the, the, uh, the you can sort of see in chapter or section two the positive, the, the like the positive side side of things. He's kind of in some ways transitioning to um, here's here's a positive way of thinking of what beauty is. Um, thirty five, middle thirty five. Once again, um, the the thesis proposed in a slightly different way. The same same thesis I think stated in a different way. At this point, I would like to propose a thesis. This is always a good way to introduce a thesis. <laughs> I would like to propose a thesis, which will undergird the rest of our reflections in this chapter. Namely, that beauty offers a kind of paradigm of appearance and so perception, which is to say that it represents appearance as perfected, isolated in its purity, we might say. Uh, to put it another way, beauty captures the essence of both appearance and perception. Um, so what you what you have in we can just maybe run through little highlights of the history of ancient or modern philosophy getting the impoverished experience mm -hmm. and the reason Schindler thinks the modern experience has been an impoverished one is because it doesn't it doesn't have beauty um, as the, the the way of of seeing the world and what what this does sort of maybe starting with Descartes, but it, it definitely goes before Descartes. This is end of scholasticism. Um, what you get is you get a, a separation of what is seen from um, the, th the, the reality of the thing that's seen. So, so what, what I mean is people thought um, what, what you see is, is – just these, or what you experience are these mental impressions, these things that happen in you. So the experience of seeing is an experience that happens in your brain, in your mind, in your soul, however you want to think of it. And, and that, that is a, 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 um, an experience cut off from the reality of the thing that's out there in the world. And the question then is how do I know that what I'm actually experiencing corresponds to what's out there in the world. Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to... to this is the Cartesian kind of it, move, it's right? the ex Yeah, it's yeah. the exact... Cart but what's interesting is I think Descartes is, is only capable of framing it in this incredibly explicit way because of the implicit um, roots, uh -huh. the implicit that seeds that came before him, yeah. right? So, so yeah. I think although Descartes the the manifestation right. of this 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 mind world divide it has to be before him and therefore it's got to be in the the, the neo-scholastic in the metaphysics um, of those guys yeah, even yeah. if they don't put it out there as epistemology right right and they don't really call it into question whereas what descartes is doing is he's calling it into question even though it's the same metaphysics uh -huh. right so um so i think descartes is just kind of doing an honest neo-scholasticism mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh which might mean then that the rest of rest of modernity is doing um uh, the, the neo-scholastic project mm -hmm. as well. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's kind of an interesting history of philosophy interpretation. But but what you have is you have my experience, and we, we, we put it now in terms of, like, the brain events. The seeing is something that happens in your brain. Mm -hmm. um, hearing is something that happens in a different part of your brain. And so then what you want to try to, to do is to say, but what, what does what's going on in my brain have to do with what's going on in the world? Mm -hmm. How do I know... That there's this, there's this real connection. How do I know that I'm just not thinking about sort of my own, my own perceptions and not perceptions of, of things. things yeah, right? yeah. And um, what 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 you have is you have Descartes making this this proposal. How do you know this? And he he grounds it in ultimately it turns out to be God. You're not a deceiver, and yada yada. Um, and and most of the the history of philosophy since since Descartes is this attempt to to, to wrestle with this problem in one form or another. Mm -hmm. um, it can be in regards to perception, but then they said it could also be in terms of just generic 
thinking, how do I know my thoughts of what's true, even mathematical thoughts, actually correspond to the real mm -hmm. mathematical truths that I'm not just, you know, I think these mathematical truths are actually true, but there's something more mysterious that I'm missing that, you know, that I'm getting wrong. So anyway, um, I, I think you, you get this, this divorce between the reality of something and the appearance of something. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people that read this think, oh, Plato did that. Plato made this divide between the appearance of something and the reality of something. But I, I think what Schindler is saying, although he might not say this explicitly, but what he's trying to do is to say appearance, and this is, a, I think, what Section 2 is, is an attempt to do. Appearance isn't um, an appearance unless it is the appearing of something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he says that specifically. Yeah, so, yeah, right. So it's an appearance of a reality. So that... Um, you can never, you can never talk about, um, or you should never talk about uh, appearance as disconnected from a reality, because he's he's wanting to say there's a, a completely different way of thinking about the world, whereas the appearance isn't something that generates within me, and then I have to try to take the appearance. And like, s reach it out into the world to see if it actually see if fits. It stamps on it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rather, what you should the way the way to think of appearance is something, and this is this is Clark in many ways through and through. Something Clark was in here a lot. I think yeah, I saw. speaking to you, right? Uh, and and mm -hmm. so so that what you what you get is the uh, the appearing of something is not. Um, to be rejected as dubious or something you should be skeptical of, mm -hmm. but rather should be accepted as um, a way of something communicating mm -hmm. itself. And and now you, you need to be somewhat, I don't know if critical is the, the best word, but you need to be aware that you're not receiving the entire the entirety of the reality because it can only communicate itself in a, in a limited way mm -hmm. um, and so the appearance is not the reality and I think what what Schindler's saying beauty is beauty is the 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 recognition that the appearance of something is actually a good in itself mm -hmm. whereas mm -hmm. I I mean my, I always thought, the appearance needs to be gotten over so that you can get to the real get thing. to the real thing yeah. and beauty is is what gives you that transition from the appearance to the reality um, so now when you when you look at something with the eyes of of, of, of the beautiful or, or sort of with with the, 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 the beauty in mind what you're trying to do is you're trying to look beyond the appearance whereas I don't think that's what Schindler's saying here at all i think he's saying no beauty in some ways goes to the the appearance and it takes the appearance as its object mm -hmm. it's distinct I and mean, that that was that was definitely new to me um mm -hmm. it, but it, one of his key points is and, and maybe i'm jumping ahead but uh, on page 42 um he makes the point that it's not mere appearance right uh, that it, it's appearance of a reality of something meaningful even if what is perceived is not rendered into distinct concepts of reason. Um, and his footnote, footnote 30, is very interesting, um, where he kind of says, precisely as appearance, it cannot be rendered into concepts, so it's kind of mysterious. Yeah. Um, but this mistake has mistakenly led some to think that it has therefore no relation at all to the conceptual, which is not, does not follow. A thing can be distinct and yet remain inseparable from another thing. I, I wrote a little Trinitarian... <laughs> mark down there because I think there's there's this idea of being distinct but united yeah. and I think that's what he's saying about appearance appearance is distinct from the thing but united with the thing not as a separate in a sense not a separate thing but as as the thing's own self mm -hmm. self manifestation yeah yeah and so that when you see the appearance you are seeing the the um you're seeing the reality, but only as 
as revealed, I mean, he goes on, in, I think, in the next sentence, only as revealed or disclosed in a certain limited way. Mm-hmm. Um, and this, this makes me think of, of Clark again, where he, he talks about um, the act, the act of a thing, that a thing is exists for its act, its yeah. operation. And so it seems like the manifestation or the appearance is its act that is yeah. acted out to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's there's two sides. There's going to be two sides of that. There's the right. there's the, the subjective and the objective, right. which right. I which I which I like. Um, but finishing finishing this thought, it, this is the the more that I think about this, the more I realize Clark is really um, consonant with with a lot of this. So mm-hmm. continuing on, right there on forty two, where you left off, we might say that beauty is appearance understood as a distinctively human experience under the aspect of revelation, as a disclosure of reality. It is significant that the senses to which beauty most commonly appeals are specifically the intellectual senses, that is, the senses that are capable of grasping meaningful signs, namely vision and hearing. The point is that appearance in this understanding is not a self-generated feeling stimulated in the brain, but an image a representation that includes within itself, however inquietly, the co-presence of its origin mm-hmm. or the reality it communicates. Some reality is implicit in the appearance in which we delight as beautiful. Mm-hmm. So, so there is this, and, and and I don't know if we really have good words for the relationship of this co-presence. This, mm-hmm. the, the 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 source is in is in this the the. Um, what's communicated or the the meaning is in the letters or the the shapes of, of the word mm-hmm. um the uh the, the spiritual reality if you want to call it is in the icon i i don't like whatever that i mean i think the word we use is beauty <laughs> yeah yeah right so so right yeah so so i think there's there's nothing this, maybe this highlights an interesting point there's nothing that can make that more intelligible uh-huh, uh-huh. other than those. So if you're trying to analyze that relationship of that that indwelling or that co-presencing um, in a more fundamental way, you're, you're, you're trying to move beyond beauty. So, so almost saying that it, maybe that's what it, it means that beauty is a transcendental, that it is fundamental. Yeah, and uh, that it is um, not explainable by other things because it is, the, it is the, it is in some sense the base. Right, and and then you can recognize, may, I mean, maybe recognize that all things that exist are going to have that indwelling or that co-presence that can be seen in their in their a, a appearance or in their appearing to another, and so so to be is to be beautiful in that sense it's to have the co is to be co-present with Mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. and so so all being in virtue of being is Mm -hmm. is beautiful because of that that co-presence of the uh the source with it Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and so to try to think of it in, in any other way is to um to move to move beyond it and therefore it's to try to think of being in a non being way. In a non-being kind of way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, I, I think that that's helpful to me because it makes me realize what, in a, in, a, in a new way, what is meant by the term transcendental. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, the, the, yeah. Hmm. There's a, I mean, I don't know where you want to go next, but there, there's, there's this very interesting idea of what it means to, to see this too. I mean, it's, it's, he, he seems to say, and maybe this is the subjective side, um, but he seems to say that not everybody can can, can really recognize the co-presence, and and I think one of his great concerns, starting from the the beginning of this book, um, yeah, uh, the the first chapter, um, is that we we might live in such a way that we're we're actually blinded to the reality of beauty mm-hmm. and to the co-presence of things. Um, in their appearances, and and even the co-presence of, and as he puts it, right, God in all things, um, and so his 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 concern is that I, I think one of his points of bringing up all this beauty stuff is to get us to realize that 
we need to be able to see this as it really is, or we ourselves, the world won't be completed and we won't be fulfilled yeah. because of that. Right? So it seems like if the point of man is, as he kind of gets into at the very end here, if the point of man is to encounter the world and we don't encounter the world, then the world and man both suffer for, for, for it. Right? Yeah, and, yeah. It, and it makes every, ultimately, I think it makes everything absurd. Yeah, no, I think I think you're right. I think because nothing nothing can possess no, nothing can possess an internal meaning, mm. right? If if you if there if there is no beauty, then um, there there's going to be no no possibility of an internal um, meaning because you'll have um, either all the meaning comes from outside of the world. It's going to be um, God, who's entirely. This is that email I sent to you about the book I'm, I'm hoping to, to work on. It's mm-hmm. going to be outside mm-hmm. of the world, mm-hmm. so 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 that you have the opposition between the reality, the true reality, God, and and this world, which is sort of a an appearance world, a shadow world, if you yeah. want to put it that way. Sort right. of terminology. Christians tend to use, right. but by making that opposition, you've you've cut off the ability to to um, to see any meaning in this world here, um, which which leads to a radical rejection of the world. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah, in in a false way. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's the Nietzschean interpretation of Christianity is right. it's a rejection of the world, and unfortunately, a lot of Christians do reject the world. Right, and it's understandable because when you go on and read people like Gregory of Nyssa, you can kind of and St. Paul, you kind of get the impression, maybe they're rejecting the world. Right. <laughs> because they say things like this, reject the world. <laughs> 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 but, but I think, I think to, to understand what they meant by reject the world, it's not reject creation. Right. The wor- world, reject wor- incarnation. The, world, wor- the word world is used in many ways. Yeah. 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 And so, I, so I think, um, I think it's, it's Schmaiman has a great meditation on that. Uh, yeah. Is this in uh, Life of the an, World? Or? I think it's an article that he wrote. I don't remember okay. where it is. But, um, but I, I, I think that, <coughs> that is a... Um, um, I think that's the foundation of the... Uh, I forget where Dostoevsky says it. Life, beauty will save the world. <laughs> it's the idiot. The idiot. The idiot says it. Everyone... I was just writing about that this morning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a great thing. But I think every, I mean, it's, it, it, a lot of people have heard that. Few people, I think, know what it, what it, what I, it means. I, this is why I woke up this morning at 5 a.m. And, and, and started writing. Because it was Schindler that made me realize what that meant. Mm-hmm. And, and my Ooh. thought of what it meant up until this morning yeah. is, was bourgeois metaphysics. Yeah, yeah. I'm positive. You, you gotta, you, you're like, you gotta, what we Near gotta do. We got appearance. Yeah, what we got to do is we got to get beautiful, pretty things. Pretty things. Yeah, pretty yeah. things. That's 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 what I think that I that I thought that meant. But but this makes me realize when we say beauty will save the world, it is it is is a recognition of the, of the real meaning of reality. Yeah, the reality of reality, as he called yeah. it. Yeah, right? yeah, and I, I I think that's a beautiful way of it's seeing the reality of reality. Yeah. And and I think, or, or as, some, as someone has once put it, the depth of the depth. Yeah, the depth, <laughs> the depth of the depth. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Is that Jesus? <laughs> he looks like him. You go cast out into the deep, but not the deep of the deep. That's, you'll catch a goat out there. <laughs> okay. Sorry. It's the next context you don't want. Yeah. 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 So. Um, yeah. So here. Uh, there's there's so much. Here, I know, I know. I, I don't want to take over. I have, here's, I have like 50 here's, things I want to here's a few, I'll just I'll just start spouting ideas and thoughts that right. I had while I was reading this. So okay. bottom of 36. Okay. And please, for those listening, uh, if you have questions or like, oh, I was hoping you guys would talk about this, feel free to, to, to send me an email or to write in the comment section or something and yeah. say, hey, could you guys talk about this? Because you didn't talk about it because instead you were talking about the depths of the depths. <laughs> And I was looking for you to talk about the shallows or something. So. <laughs> um, but here on bottom of 36 going to 37, uh, um, they virtually, but they virtually all agreed it is essentially something subjective, even if they sought 
to determine more or less objective rules to provide a standard for the judgment of taste. Uh, here he's, he's talking about Hume and Locke and yeah, the British empiricists. The British empiricists. Who he disagrees with. Who, who saw everything as, as the experience of beauty was, was just merely purely subjective, but tried to find an objective standard by which to, to, judge. to order or judge the subjective experiences. So I have my experience, you have your experience, and, you, and yet we need to find a way to say, no, this truly, this is, this, these subjective experiences are not good. And, but the experience themselves is always just a merely this, this, internal internal. This experience. idea makes me think of, of the arguments that people have today of what art is. Yeah. But they're all talking with the same perception. So they want to put a standard on something that can't be standardized. Yeah. Because it's all subjective. Yeah. And, and I think, and I think um, even those that want an objective, like we, uh, arts of beauty is objective, I think they, they, they make the proclamation that beauty is objective with the same metaphysics yeah. that those yeah. who say beauty is subjective right. hold. It's just they take the opposite side, but right. it's still the same metaphysics. Yes, I agree. Right? It's, still a, it's still a dualism of, is, of subject and object. Which is what I did when I yeah. read Dostoevsky. Right? Yeah. This is what I thought. This is what I thought. So, so, so this is great. It goes on. When we call something beautiful from this perspective, the empiricist separation – of appearance and reality, um, something beautiful from this perspective. We are talking more basically about ourselves than about a reality in the world. Um, and I read that, and I, I immediately sent Dr. Fikamich an email saying, you've got to read The Abolition of Man. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I, I forgot to do I it. don't know, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. But, but there's this um, – let's see if I can dig, dig it up while I'm talking. This is probably a bad idea. But there's um, – I could talk while you dig. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you remember this? Have you read The Abolition of Man? The Green Book, right? You were talking yeah, about The Green, the Green Book. Book. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's about uh, Samuel uh, Taylor Coleridge's um, explanation of the waterfall, right? Yeah, yeah, And yeah. he calls it sublime, right? And uh, and, and the people, the, the, the authors of The Green Book, who he gives different names, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, they say what he meant was he felt like sublime or he yeah, felt like yeah. So, Have so, you got it? Yep, here it is. I think. Yeah. So, so um, you rem so this is C.S. Lewis's um, Abolition of Man, the uh, section "Men Without Chest." You should, you should read this and meditate on this. This is great stuff. Yeah, it is. It is. You remember that there were two tourists present. That one called it sublime. That is this waterfall, uh, and the other pretty. <laughs> and that Coolridge uh, mentally endorsed the first judgment and rejected the second with disgust. Okay, and then and then he comes up with these fake names for these people that are the author of this this gr kid's grammar, grammar book, book that he used that he used, and I held his his actual his, his actual yeah. green book in in Chicago outside of Chicago. I went to the C.S. Lewis Library and held in my very hand. The, green, the book. green book that he is talking about here, but you don't remember the name of it or the name of the author. Uh, I forget. I forget the name of it. And the name of it, but I, I remember looking at it. And, <laughs> I mean, it was some. It was like a really boring title, like you know, <laughs> grammar for little boys. Grammar, grammar for <laughs> elementary school boys. <laughs> elementary grammar for elementary school boys <laughs> in an elementary way, <laughs> um, and perhaps false. Uh, but in the margins, I mean, he he marks the book kind of like you do. Yeah, uh, not as much underlining, but in comments in the margins that yeah. are like. This is absurd. <laughs> um, okay, so so but but he goes on. So so two two tourists both look at the same waterfall. One says it's sublime. One says it's pretty. Okay, so the authors of of this grammar book comment as follows: When the man said this is sublime, he appeared to be making a remark about the waterfall. Actually, he was not making a remark about the waterfall, but a remark about his own feelings. What he was saying was really, I have feelings associated in my mind with the word sublime. Or shortly, I have sublime feelings, end quote. <laughs> That's what the, the authors. And then he spends the rest of, of, you know, the five pages or so of this beginning of this chapter saying how absurd this is. Just how, how like, just foolish it is to say, to say this. Uh, really interesting reflection. But I think um, he... Uh, that is Lewis. I don't really think he's he's making a, a point about beauty. Although I want to go back and read this um, the whole thing now, but I, I, it's the exact same point that Schindler is making uh -huh. here: is that it's really common when people 
say things of let's say like value judgments what they're really about are one's own um, feelings and I thought it was it was just an interesting parallel with what what you get in um, uh, Lewis mm-hmm. and the recognition that when you say that something is sublime or beautiful you are not talking about well in some sense you are talking about your experience, but it's yeah. your experience of oh, the thing. The thing, and it, and it wouldn't be the same experience if it wasn't of that reality. Right. Um, right. So I don't want to. Yeah, I, I, I think I think the danger in reading what you read is to say those guys are idiots. They're wrong. It was talking about the waterfall only. Yeah, and that would be false too. And I, th- when I read Lewis, I think that's initially what I thought. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember thinking that. But I think this idea that, that, that Schindler gets into, and, and, and I think, you know, the um, page 43, where he, he, he actually quotes C.S. Lewis down here, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, which, w- with a very Nissa quote, by the way, yeah, it was yeah. when I was happiest that I longed most. Exactly what, yeah, what, yeah. what, what Nissa would say yeah, about yeah. Eros and Agape, right? Um, but, but it's this idea that there's a twofold thing in beauty there's the self showing, the showing themselves in appearance. Which he calls their glory, which I'm sure he's stealing from Balthazar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right when I read that, I thought, I thought, of, yeah, I circled it. Yeah, yeah, I was like, this is Balthazar. Um, and uh, and the other hand, though, is the subjective, which he says is the non-possessive openness to things that our contemplative release, our letting be, implies is not contrary to resolution or closure, but coincident with it. So this the subjective and objective, which I know you want to get into here, yeah. but. But the idea is, I, I think, in this waterfall scenario, I don't want to say he's talking about the waterfall and not himself. Neither do I want to agree with the Green Book and say he's yeah. talking about himself and not the waterfall. Yeah. I want to say it's D- both. Yeah, the it's only the reason, glory of the showing of the waterfall to the receiver. And the only reason to, to, to properly understand the experience that that one tourist had um, is to see that it is, in this very particular moment, something very universal happening. Yeah. Right. So, so I, as a particular observer of this, am having this particular experience, but only because of this, this showing of the waterfall to me. Right. right? And 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 I think to think, oh, this is beautiful and it has nothing to do with me. Um, I think is to to downplay the role of the perceiver. I mean, for those, hopefully, most of you actually read the Aristotle and, and such, you'll realize perception is, is, a, is a really significant thing that it actually brings the perfection of the perceived objects. Yeah, I mean, he says, the perception he says it right here, right? And, and I, I didn't say this exactly, but um, 43 again. There's a twofold affirmation embedded in this one. On the one hand, it means objectively that things reach a certain completeness yeah. in showing themselves in appearance. Yeah, They yeah. reach a completeness in showing themselves. And but but you can't show yourself unless there's somebody to show yourself to. Yeah, and and you don't successfully show yourself unless it's perceived right. and, and and perceived properly by uh, another. Right, and this is this is Clark all over the place. Right? Yeah, so I think I think you 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 don't you you help the waterfall to be actually beautiful by you properly seeing it, receiving it. Uh, right. So so I I think. It's it's this it's this um, uh, conjunction or this commingling of the objective and the subjective, and I think initially people want to say no, there's beauty is just objective, mm-hmm. but that's that's in response to this beauty view, is just which is just entirely <laughs> subjective. But yeah. I think that's it's the same mistake, it's the same yep. error, but on the because because there's an opposition between the objective and the subjective, which. Or between yep. the thing and the perceiver, which is exactly what we're rejecting and going beyond. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we're saying that they actually uh, they complete each other, and they and, and and that in beauty they seem to, in a sense, be united with one another. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And so you can't take into account one without the other. Yeah. 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 It's like saying is is perception subjective or objective? And I, just just mere perception. And I think. If you said it was purely subjective, then there would be no world. If there was, yeah. if it was purely objective, then there would really be no, no perceiver, <laughs> right? And then it'd be saying like, you know, you, you, brick walls can perceive, 
right? yeah. brick walls are perceiving the the open window across the room yeah, and, yeah. And, right if there's no if there it had nothing to do with the the the, the receiver the perceiver then that is the the subject then yeah there would be no no perception so i think it's it's this it has to be a unity of the two right yeah yeah um so here here's another another thought we're, we're, since we're just sort of playing let's talk about interesting thoughts <laughs> um I found 41 a really um, important page. Mm -hmm. uh, and the thing that I, and there's a lot on it that, a bunch of different ideas, but the you one that I would You ran out of margins, it looks like. Yeah, no, I ran out of margins. <laughs> I had to go down to the bottom of the page. Um, <laughs> but he, here, starting with, um, actually, let's just read the last paragraph. Yeah. It is precisely on this score that we begin to understand the significance of beauty being concerned with the appearance as distinct from the reality of things, right? So this is what's interesting. Beauty is about the appearance, but once again, emphasizing not mere appearance, because in a sense, there is no such thing as a right. mere appearance. It's about the appearance of of, um, of things rather uh, and, and distinct from the, the reality of them. Speaking somewhat metaphorically, uh, we could say that whereas the desire for the good is a, a desire to have the reality itself, Beauty is a mere gratuitous appetite. More gratuitous. Sorry, a more gratuitous appetite that allows the reality simply to be in itself and accepts what the reality gives or shows of itself. Similarly, while beauty appeals to our intellect, it does not satisfy our desire for understanding in the way that truth does. The desire for truth is ordered to a grasp of the essence of a thing which again concerns the inner reality beyond mere appearance. But our desire for beauty is an intellectual desire that rests in the appearance itself. Note that we are not saying that mere appearance, we're not saying mere appearance here. And he goes on. But what, so when I read this, I was thinking, maybe this is, this is why beauty is so important, is because it realizes that the way to goodness and the way to truth has to be by way of beauty. And it's what gives the desire for goodness and the desire for truth the needed humility, if you want to put it that way, um, so that the desire for goodness doesn't take its object to be grasped mm -hmm. and the desire for the truth doesn't take its object to be grasped. Mm -hmm. Because it wants that. It wants to completely circumscribe completely obtain its end which is the, the true and the good but it's only in, in in the contours of beauty that it recognizes the way to get the true quote get the true and to get the good is as it presents itself which is always going to be a presentation mm -hmm. and therefore a um um kind of a, a, a i was going to say a limit a limiting or a, a it's going to come under a particular um, mode because of right. the fact that we're creatures, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, page 47 at the bottom, or near the bottom, about five-sixths of the way down. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps three-fourths. <laughs> Our thesis has been, there it is. <laughs> yeah. Our thesis has been the beauty enables a real encounter between man and the world. That was what you read, actually, earlier at this podcast. Yeah. In the presence of the beautiful, which is a sort of open embrace Open embrace. I mean, that's that's like almost Gregory of Nyssa paradoxical yeah, language. Right? Yeah. Open embrace. Both truly an embrace and truly open. A space of existence emerges that is wide enough for the world to be actually present to us yeah. and for the full unfolding of our acts of intellect and will from their origin to their proper term, as we will see in the following two chapters. To switch metaphors, beauty helps to root us in place, to involve us deeply in the reality uh, there where we find ourselves, or in Heidegger's words, to set us in the earth. So uh, it, the last line in that paragraph, beauty affects a completeness that strengthens our capacity to be open and hospitable. Sounds very Benedictine. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But this idea of an open embrace, right? So uh, I, think th I think that's capturing your idea of humility, right? Yeah. Um, instead of the truth wanting to grasp, um, a CS, going back to C.S. Lewis, right? His, his understanding of the demonic is that which seeks to consume, eat other yeah. things, right? Um, Screwtape proposes a toast is a great meditation on um, his eating of the de of the evil evil 
evil humans. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all he wants is to eat a delectable Hitler, as he, yeah, as he puts yeah. it. Right? Um, but that's, that's a grasping kind of seeking of truth and good. It's beauty that's the humble letting be, which is, a, in a sense, an existing with and indwelling in, a mutual indwelling, yeah. rather than a consuming. In order, quote, in order to receive the discourse properly, we have to arise, to come outside of ourselves to meet it, and in a sense to indwell it. There you go. Right. Reality is not supplied in abstract packets of information so directly into our brain that we lose the distinction between the world and mental sensation. Right. So I think that this um, this this idea that in, in some ways when you were when you were saying um, you. The, the, the consuming is like to consume something uh, with the <coughs> Lewis it's sort of like the, the evil you know act in some ways and, and then I was thinking but what about what about like the Eucharist and, mm -hmm. and the, this the, and, but then I was I was thinking but in some ways what that is is the proper reception of it is not I'm consuming it but in some ways it's consuming yeah. me right so it's, it's to present yourself so rather than thinking that you're coming up so that you can receive, uh -huh. in some ways, I uh -huh. mean, this, this is like really paradoxical, but in some yeah, ways yeah. Like you receive so you can take from from the, the priest Christ and you can take Christ, but rather it's this attempt to, to, to present yourself to Christ. And so it, it actually is a way of you being consumed, offering yourself up uh -huh. for... <laughs> and maybe in, in, in some sense, uh, the, even the liturgical uh, gesture where it is contrary to liturgical law to ever take the Eucharist for yourself. Yeah. You can only receive it from another. Yeah. Um, and so anybody who had sort of a coronavirus ideas of, you know, let's just put the Eucharist in, a, in, in the patent on the altar and everybody can come and take one yeah. would be completely yeah. contrary to the yeah. Eucharist as it is. Yeah. Right. Because it's not there for the taking. Yeah, right. It's only to be received. As, as he puts it, I mean, the, the, the next next couple sentences here, right? Things of the world have their own depth, their own significance to which we are offered access. Yeah. We're offered it, right? And so it demands that we, as he puts it, extend courtesy to things. What a great line. In such a world, things may indeed serve human purposes, right? This is the utilitarian, right? That things are good for X. But if they do so, it is not in abject slavery. Rather, they offer themselves for this use in something analogous to a noble freedom. Yeah. Interesting thinking of things having freedom. This is a Schmitzian Schmitz, idea, right? Yeah, yeah. In which their own reality preserves its integrity. Their service takes the form of a gift gratefully received. So I, I like this idea of giving courtesy to things. And, and I get worried, and, and, and I think he's worried about this too, um, in a throwaway culture – in, in in a situation where we create things that are made to do, to 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 break, or or made to be disposed, yeah, do we not extend courtesy to reality, right? And do we instead uh, make it into a slave of us? Right? Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> so I'm starting to see why why beauty is. Um, so central. Mm -hmm. um, so top of the, so this is going to carry on your, that point you just made. Top of forty six. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, in beauty, nature is affirmed in its integrity, even as it is transcended or brought to a level that exceeds, so to speak, its natural capacities. This is this is where it gets intense <laughs> we have in artistic recreation a stunning foreshadowing of the transformation of nature by grace which presupposes the givenness of the nature it elevates right, so maybe one way to think of what's going on is um, um, to, to, to understand art so this is they're sort of playing on the art imitating um, nature and mm -hmm. and perfecting um, someone's perfecting nature. Um, 
you have a foreshadowing of nature being perfected by grace mm-hmm. um, and, and, in, and in some ways nature um, being presupposed um, and, and grace building on nature so that in some ways nature perfects in, in a completely different sense but nature perfects grace and that it like it it provides the 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 the, the, the background in which it can flourish mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. Um, but once you once you lose sight of of beauty um, in this in this way, you lose sight of what it means for art to imitate and, and not just imitate, but but to perfect and not to, to not to ape. Yeah, not to ape, but to, to mm-hmm. um, right to, to to in its own way to, to bring about sort of a, a, a natural recreation, a recreation mm-hmm. of nature, mm-hmm. um, so that. Um, nature can become more than itself. Mm-hmm. Um, works of art are in some ways more than just mere blobs of paint on the page, mm-hmm. right? And if you lose sight of that, then I think you're going to automatically lose sight of what it means for nature to be perfected by by grace. And and so because the the if Schindler is right, it seems that the model, not really the model, the um, archetype, the archetype is is. Um, is going to be beauty um, or the way in which you understand the archetype is going to have to be as beautiful, right? And so the way in which you understand the relation between nature and grace looks like it has to be in terms of beauty, Mm -hmm. just as the way you understand the relation between art and nature um, is going to have to be in terms of of beauty. And Mm -hmm. if you you don't have that, then art and nature both are going to – collapse into each other mm-hmm. there is no distinction between art and nature mm-hmm. there's just technology and i think if you don't if you don't have beauty and you're looking at nature and grace they're going to collapse into each other uh-huh. there's going to be no distinction between nature and grace and it's just going to turn into spiritual technology yeah 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 right? yeah um and so so i i i think interestingly you get a preservation of both nature and grace via beauty just as you get a preservation of art and nature via beauty. Mm-hmm. So it looks like beauty is what holds the distinction, the unity and sort of perfection of the one and the other, but still distinct. Uh, that comes about only by way of beauty, it looks like. Which which uh, maybe goes back to the whole idea of glory and, and the fact of the glory of God or whatever we Whatever, whatever yeah. we mean when we say that, we, we're talking about uh-huh. the unity of distinction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man. Oh, here's a, here's something great. Oh, you got some. You got great things you want to talk about. Too. No, I don't. I'm waiting for you. Oh, this is great. This is great, man. Oh. Footnote forty five. Footnote forty five. Roger Scruton. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Uh, he says. Also, Schiller makes Ooh. a similar point uh, when he spoke of beauty as manifesting. As it were, the person of the thing. Shoot, I I, I missed that footnote. <laughs> Man, so this was this is like exactly what we were toying with when we were reading Clark about, in some ways, the person, the person esque quality of all things yep. in, in virtue of simply being. Yeah. Um, here you have Schiller saying um, something similar, but not in terms of their being, but in terms of beauty right so Mm -hmm. it seems that beauty also suggests this person-esque quality of everything because everything seems to be a communication it seems to be a speaking yeah Yeah. everything's a speaking everything's a speaker here's here's another as you were talking about the nature grace thing here's here's another idea let's let's go back to man as being made in the image of god yeah um so god perfects man by gifting to him the supernatural by gifting to him grace and that bec- and then man is able to step outside of himself and in stepping outside of himself is able to be perfected but only from another the waterfall mm-hmm. isn't perfected by being a waterfall or maybe better put it isn't a waterfall until it's seen as sublime by someone yeah by man and so that man in receiving the communication of the waterfall of its own nature 
as, as, as Schindler put it, right, um, it, things are completed objectively, things reach a certain completion in showing themselves in appearance. That man, in a, in a godlike way, um, grants supernaturality to the waterfall who cannot be seen yeah. by another and be perfected unless man be the seer. Yeah. And therefore we, um, I don't know if I want to say we divinize it or we personize it. We yeah. personize yeah. the waterfall by seeing it and by, by having its communication be communicated. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are able to, in a sense, supernaturalize it. Yeah. Above what what waterfall nature yeah. is, it becomes it becomes fully itself when it's more than itself by communicating itself to a person. Yeah. And so, but this is only true. This is only possible in like a, a beautiful way. Yeah. Yeah. In, in beauty. It, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, somewhere in Balthazar's Glorious Lord, um, I think it was volume the, the the volume on the metaphysics in, in antiquity. Okay. I think it was in there where he talks about the being seen by God is what being yep. is. Yeah. Yeah. So in some ways in some ways you, all is you don't I don't I I don't know, I'm thinking that w a, a common tendency is that people think we need to do something in order to bring about um, the like in metaphysics, right? So just just like in metaphysics, right? Or or even in, in you know philosophical psychology or uh -huh. whatever, or in physics. I mean, any 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 study. Here are some questions that present themselves, and we have to work really hard to resolve these questions so that, like, the truth can be true. Uh -huh. right? But but what's interesting is the truth being true doesn't have to do with our discovering discovery it of it. Like but that. in some ways, our discovering of it does play a role in it it being brought to a to glory, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. But its its truth is 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 more fundamental to our knowing it because it's already known, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so I, I think there's this interesting, in, interesting thing that's going on when you think about what Schindler's saying in light of, um, and maybe even what we saw with Aristotle, what have you. And then if you embed all that in, in this understanding of God as as all knowing, um, and and so in some ways. Um, it's never the case that things aren't perceived or things aren't known um, in, in, a, in a much more fundamental yeah. sense. Right. But yeah. that doesn't mean you don't have anything to, to, to do. Right. Right? Like, oh, it's already known, so I don't have to do anything. Right, right. Um, <laughs> but, but I, 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 because it's already known by God is its in itselfness yeah. in a sense. Yeah, right. yeah. And so, so it, it might be... Um, I, I think in some ways that's like the foundation for why um, things are capable of existing and asking themselves the question, what am I? Uh -huh. um, because they're already known for what they are by another, mm -hmm. that they can even ask themselves the question, what am I? Which is, I mean, talk about paradoxical. Uh, I am, my in itselfness is my being known by another. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I can say, what am I? Asking about my in itselfness um, because it exists by another. Right. And I think that's why um, um, God's love and knowledge of you or all things is always going to exceed and be more gracious than your return of the gift mm -hmm. because it, it's sort of. It's it's that prior knowledge and love which allows for the possibility of of like a return. Does that is this making any? Or as or as one person once said, it's it's not because you loved him, but because he loved you first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was that Aaron too? <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> when, he, when he was courting John. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, uh, it also, I think, points to the fact that we are, by nature, mysterious to ourselves. Yeah. Right? Because of the, the greaterness of us. Because of the indwelling of, of, of him in us and, 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 and the, the co-presence of him in us. And it, but, but it's not a separate co-presence. It's not like here I am and, and, and also there's this added God sprinkles too. Right? Yeah. It's instead I am the co-presence of God in some radical way. Right? That's just what it means to be. Because, to, because as you put it earlier, to be beautiful is to be. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I think, um, so where is this, where is this going? Uh, at, so, so, so we had, we had chapter one, you have, you have chapter two, which, so chapter one's kind of setting the scene yep. in some ways for, for what is, what is philosophy and how, and how is it that you, you understand the, the, the relation of philosophy to the pursuit of transcendentals and, and reality and how does that contrast with technology chapter two begins with um or chapter two consists of this discussion of beauty um three and four have to, to do with goodness and truth so so where where is this going i think it, this is the way this is all set up is uh to to show that once you have a, a I don't want to say an understanding, but but once you start to to see the world first and foremost under the 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 um, the, the the colors or with the colors of beauty that you not the colors of the wind, not the colors of the wind. <laughs> although, although, that, that's although what I, that is I was actually listening to that, that listening to that song. <laughs> long story, uh, since we and, but it, it it has to do with um, I know the trees in a way that all these other things aren't going to know that because they're, they're basically like persons to me. They're, yeah, yeah. They have an individual particular character. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. Like you don't see things. Uh, how does she, how does she, she said, you'll see things that you never thought you would see or something <laughs> like that. But I mean, it's, it's interesting. Um, but anyway. Um, no, the, she says you'll learn things you never knew you never knew. Yeah. That's something like that. Yeah. Something like that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pocahontas, put it right alongside deep. Plato and Aristotle. No, I think it's. I think it's. I think that movie. One of the things it's about, I think, is about technology. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I yeah, do. yeah. Um, uh, but anyway, I totally do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anytime you have a Disney movie where the white man comes to the, the primitive land, it's always, I think, going to be about technology and stuff. Yeah. which is not the worst thing to hear. No, no. Um, so, so beauty. You have to learn to see the world. Not, I mean, as beautiful, that doesn't mean as pretty, right? So this is an, it's really important to understand. It doesn't mean to learn to see it as like, like, you know, it, it sounds nice. It looks nice. And mm-hmm. that mere, pl- mere pleasing. Pleasing. Yeah. It's yeah. not, it's not that you see the world as, as, as aesthetically pleasing. Um, so, so you have to learn to see the world that way in order for you to see the world to see to see reality as good and as true so i think i think i think the way it's set up and the way that balthazar's trilogy is set up i think is mm-hmm. is in that that way that it 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 allows for you to now see the goodness of things and to see why the goodness of things is um appealing you might say mm-hmm. uh and and to see the the, the the truth of truth uh, so so it seems like beauty is what provides that um, that 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 openness to um, to these new ways of, of experiencing or having things speak to you mm-hmm. um, they can speak to you as good as beautiful mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and it's only if you can first under first have like that background of of, of beauty that you're going to be open to hearing the goodness of things and the truth of things. Yeah. I, w- one last point. I, yeah. I know we're over yeah. time here, but uh, I, I do love this idea of hope that he has um, on page 40 where he says, uh, he says, beauty, beauty elevates and calls us to something beyond ourselves. He says, in this beauty represents a remarkable source of hope. It is, so to speak, a transcendent call that can be heard by the most flesh-bound ears. 
So, I mean, one of the great concerns in his book and in my life <laughs> yeah. is uh, I want to be able to see things as they, as they are, right? And to, and to, and which, which I'm recognizing more and more is about beautiful co-presence. But he says, even the most flesh-bound ears can be broken through yeah. by, 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 by the reality of the sublime, which I think is what Dostoevsky means. The yeah. Beauty will save the world. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. So. Right on. Oh, that's good. Good. Good stuff. Good. All right. Well, you want to try let's again? Try, let's try round two. Round two. Okay. Round two. Here we go. Let's see if this sounds a little better. Uh, hopefully, this is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, it is because it bees, but yeah. hopefully, it's, uh, it's better than just a. Okay. Here we go. You just turn it. Oh, are you going right in? Yeah, we'll just do it. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.